All right, well, we are glad that you are all here on this uh, cool summer day. Yeah, comparatively speaking. It has cooled off a little bit since the last week. And in any case, uh, it doesn't matter because the, where two or more are gathered in his name, uh, so the Lord is there. Amen? Amen? So let's begin our service as we do each week with our call to worship. It's on the slide. It's also in your program. And hear the word of the Lord. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And that is in 1 Peter 2, verse 9. So now we're going to worship the Lord in song. So uh, please stand and uh, sing together, uh, Be Thou My Vision. Oh, mm -hmm. 
ready to tap your toes, right? It's one of my favorite tunes. Uh, and we would go down to the Beacon Light Homeless Mission on Wednesday nights. Uh, this is one of their favorites. So let's sing together. Mansion over the hill.
profit is not spelled P-R-O-F-I-T. I know some of you caught that, but I did not create that, so uh, it's, uh, you knew what he meant. <laughs> Victory. Thank you. We may be seated now. Good morning and welcome. Here are the announcements for this following week. Another reminder that we're having a joint service, so remember, on August 20th, we will have a joint service at Palo Verde Baptist Church. That means our service is going to be a 10 to accommodate both congregations. So I keep saying that's a treat for us. Next Week in Light Mission is Wednesday, August 16th from 7 p.m. to 8. Last time for the pastor to be there representing uh, our church, First Baptist Church, Palo Verde. So let's get a group of us together and go down and show our support for the homeless. Pastor's retirement. Pastor's retirement, will be, he will be retiring on September 1st. Last Sunday, you preach is August 27th. So um, now auto visual volunteer. Beginning Sunday, September 3rd, we have an urgent need for someone to run the slides and monitor the sound. We are prepared to pay someone to do this. So if you know anybody, see Pastor, myself, or one of the elders, and we'll take the information and call. And here's some good news. The fourth and fifth Sunday music, we have secured the services of, of an organ player for the fourth and fifth Sunday. A gentleman by the name of Tom Williamson, recently from the Rolling Hills Covenant Church, will begin playing for us on September 24th. And he came and tried our instruments, and he loved them both, and he said, it's going to be a joy to be over here and play for us. And now here's one more announcement. Okay, last week, Pastor had announced that he had received a call about helping out the victims from the uh, slides with food. So Debbie has volunteered. She has made a call, and she has volunteered to feed about 20 of them. And she's going to pick up some uh, Bon Appetit, and she's going to make a salad. She's saying that the total is 140 so if any of us can donate at least 5 or $10, it would greatly, she would greatly appreciate it, and it would help. That way we could get it done a lot easier. So please see Debbie if you have any funds that you can uh, contribute, and yes? The cost is about 100 now. Oh, the cost is now about 100 see? <laughs> so that's good. So that's all I have, and see Debbie in now. Pastor? Thank you, Victor. And uh, I really hope that we all do that. I mean, let's let's go to our pockets. And uh, Debbie's been gracious enough to take, take care of it if we don't help her. But that would be foolish, right? We're all going to give her a, give her a hand and see what you can do. And uh, that's that's what we're going to do. And the uh, the gentleman uh, who came in it was it was just awesome. It was just this fellow we ran into on a on a, a referral from Dr. Hurd actually. And the guy came in. He's wearing shorts and flip flops and saying, you know, I'll try it. And uh, so he sat down at the organ, and you would have thought Dr. Hurd was here. He, he just started playing, and the whole sanctuary filled up. He even went over and sat down at the piano, and playing like that. So the fourth and fifth Sunday, when Dr. Hurd is not here, Tom is going to be playing live music. So uh, I, I think that's going to be a, a really, really uh, terrific addition. So let's go on to the next thing that we do in our church, which is praises and prayers. So what we do, if you're visiting with us today, there's a card in your bulletin. It looks exactly like this one. And we think prayers are so important that we collect them. And if you haven't had a chance to look at your bulletin, you see there's a whole bunch of praises and prayers in there. What we do is we're going to take a moment right now, and we're going to have you write down some praises to the Lord. What are some things you want to praise the Lord for? And we always start with praises because it is my belief that in, even in your private prayer time, Starting off with praising God uh, puts your mind in the right uh, mindset to be dealing with your Heavenly Father. So let's take a moment right now, and we're going to have you write down your praises, and let's do that together right now.
you haven't already done so, now think about praises. Now think about your prayer requests. What are some things that you want to lay before the throne today? What are some things that you want to ask God to help you with? Who do you want to pray for? What do you want to pray for? Let's take a few minutes together and do that right now. Oh, I can see the world Jesus came into my heart. 
So please stand. We're doing this a cappella. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all the creatures here below. Praise Him above, ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy. and I hope you do, let's turn to uh, Acts chapter 17. And uh, if you do not have a Bible, there should be one in the pew right in front of you. Uh, and it's particularly important today because you're going to read in this particular passage that people who watch the scriptures to make sure that the preacher is preaching correctly is actually one of the key teachings of, of the text. So in our last uh, visit, we're uh, going through uh, Acts uh, with uh, these fellows that are on the road. And in our last episode, uh, this is where on TV you see the little box that says skip the intro. Well, we're not gonna do that. Uh, in our last episode, we have Paul and Silas. They were up in uh, Thessalonica. And you know, remember the story, they get in trouble and they get beat up and they get thrown into prison and they get locked in the stocks. And the angel of the Lord comes, 
There's an earthquake, all the jail doors open, and they're freed. And as a result of that, the jailer and his whole family come to Christ. And uh, you can imagine that uh, that jailer was pretty much impressed with these fellows and uh, followed accordingly. So in our story today, we're, and this is sort of, and then what happened? Um, you know, some people say that doing, doing the wrong thing repeatedly and expecting a different outcome, you know what that is? It's the definition of insanity. Well, uh, one might say then that Paul and Silas were insane because wherever they went, they, they used the same methodology, even though they ran into the same obstacles. They stuck to the same message. And for the most part, the same way of doing things. In today's text, Paul is still on his second missionary journey, and he's leading a team, a team that includes Silas, Timothy, and Luke. So they left Philippi after being severely beaten. They went, when the team got to Thessalonica, they take the very same approach, and they get the same results. This is a lesson in being consistent and trusting in the Lord. So before we dive into the text, it is our practice to uh, pray. Father God, we thank you for giving us the words, to giving us the instruction, to giving us the lessons. Sometimes we are uh, not the best students, but we pray, Lord, that you will send your Holy Spirit today to teach us what you would have for us. And uh, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so on arriving in town, we see the same plan as usual. Look at our first couple of verses up there. Now, when they had passed through Amphilopolis, don't quote me on that one, and uh, Apollonia, they, they came to Thessalonica where they were, there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul went in, and as was his custom, and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures. Now, let me pause right there. If you go back and read about how Paul worked with people, Paul was a Pharisee. He was a he's highly educated Jew, and you would think he would be like a seminary graduate. So Paul would have been deeply, deeply versed in the Old Testament scriptures. So when he was dealing with Jews, and you will very often see this phrase, that he reasoned with them from the scriptures. Because if you follow the Old Testament scriptures, Jesus is there, time after time after time, and the, the promised Messiah uh, has to be this fellow Jesus. So Paul went in, and as was his custom, and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and rise from the dead, and saying, this Jesus whom I proclaim to you is the Christ. The Christ. Jesus Christ. Christ is not his last name. The Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one in the original languages, that, that's what he's saying. And whom I proclaim to you is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a great many of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women. Of course, here's where things went wrong. You would think that after all of that, everything would be lovely. Because of jealousy and evil hearts, hard hearts, Paul's team is now attacked. Look what happens to them. In the next slide. There we go. But the Jews were jealous and taking some wicked men of the rabble they formed a mob, and they set the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason, seeking to bring them out to the crowd. And when they couldn't find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city authorities, shouting, these men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. And Jason has received them. And they are all acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying that this is another king, Jesus. And the people and the city authorities were disturbed when they heard these things. And when they had taken money as security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. And what I find ironic about this story is, you know, looking at these people are so concerned about uh, um, religion and the government and all that. When it came right down to it, as soon as somebody paid them off, 
they uh, kind of let it all go. Not unlike some people today. But there's this idea that, that some people were jealous and had wicked hearts. The Bible tells us in a couple of different places, in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, this concept of the, the heart of stone. The heart of stone. The Old Testament says, I will take your heart of stone and turn it into a, a, a heart of flesh. And the same thing is repeated in the New Testament. You see, absent the action of the Holy Spirit, the, the average human being is resistant, uh, is not open to the Word of God. And, and to some people, that just simply results in they, they ignore it. Or they just don't pay any attention to it. But for a lot of people, they can't stand the truth. Their heart of stone develops this reaction of, I've got to do something to stop that. And we, we see that very much in the world today. People are not content with uh, saying, I, I just don't believe that Bible stuff. If you go back 30 years or so, that was typically the kind of reaction you would get from people. Well, you know, that, that Bible stuff's really, really not for me. All right, I just, I just don't want to deal with all that kind of stuff. But more and more, we've got to the point where that stuff is wrong, that stuff is evil. Those Christians are haters. They're, they're fill in the phobia. They're homophobes. They're transgender phobes. They're, we're against everything. So there, it's not a matter of, well, I don't believe, but you, you know, go in your way, do whatever you want to do. Now it's like, I don't believe, and i got to stop you from shredding this stuff. There's one of the atheist writers actually has written that, that Christian, not Christianity, that religion is the greatest evil the world has ever seen. And this is a fairly intelligent fellow. And he, his argument is religion per se is evil and has caused all the evil in the world. If you've ever really tried to share your uh, beliefs with people, some, sooner or later with non-believers, you're going to run into somebody who says, well, go, look at the Crusades. Look at what all the horrible things the Christians did. Well, it's called cherry-picking. The, the, if you took every... Yeah, the Christians who did bad stuff back in the medieval times were bad, but they were doing things that were not scriptural. But if you took everything that they did, every single person that was killed under the Crusades, every single one, and you added them all up, they don't even come close to the number of people who have been killed under atheist regimes in the 20th and 21st century. So people in every religion do bad things. It, it doesn't mean that religion is bad. Because if you're going to go down that route and look at what the people in religion do and compare that to, to assess whether that religion is good or bad, you have to look at everything that they do. And even in our modern age, if you go out and look at the disasters that happen all over the world, and there was the tsunami back uh, 10, 10 years or so ago that swept through the Indian Ocean and killed 2,000 people. The first boots on the ground were World Vision. In Haiti, when they had the earthquake, and it was Christian organizations that were the first ones there. And this happens all the time. Doctors Without Borders, have you heard of those fellows? Um, they aren't a Christian organization per se, but they're coming at it from a Christian point of view. So if you're going to evaluate Christianity based on the things that Christians do, let's be fair and count everything that Christians do. All of the universities were, were started and founded by Christians. All of the hospitals were created originally by Christians. So let's add it all up. But you see, when you have a hard heart, you, you get jealousy, and from that, there's a knee-jerk reaction that we have to do something about it, and we have to put a stop to this. And that's what they're seeing. God wants us to prevail, however. God wants us to prevail. In the case of Paul's ministry treating, God puts them and us together with good people. Remember, they, they were, Jason put them up and was taking care of them, and Jason took the hit from the locals. Sometimes when we support Christian endeavors, 
we're going to get attacked by the society. So we see this happening. Paul and Silas are, are going to get snuck out of town. The brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, they went into the Jewish synagogue. Here we go. They just got run out of town. They got beaten up in one town. They got run out of town in another town for going into the Jewish synagogue. And what do they do when they get to Berea? They go to the Jewish synagogue. Now, these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. The reason every Sunday I say, bring your Bibles. Yes, we have Bibles in the pew, but you should have a Bible, and you should be in your Bible every time anybody stands here and proclaims the Word of God to you. You need to be looking at the text and listening to what's being preached to you, and you need to do to your very best ability to make sure that what you hear coming from this point aligns with what you're seeing in your Bible. Because if it isn't, then you have to decide, are you getting truth? There is no pastor who has the right and authority to modify the text to suit some personal agenda. The text is the text. And that's why he says they, they were of noble, it's funny, he says they are a more noble character, but they're double checking everything Paul's teaching them. Paul is communicating something to you. He wants you to be in the text to see if these things are so. The reason we go through all of, we preach verse by verse by verse here in this church, and we do that for a reason. You need to have context, and you need to have dialogue. You need to understand what the text is trying to tell you. I go down every Friday to the Beacon Light Mission. There's like 25 of these homeless people in a Bible study, and they're there without fail. We went through all of Paul's books, verse by verse, in the order that he read them. And I tell you the truth, those 25 people have a very good handle on Scripture. I asked him the other day, I said, when, you get, when somebody pulls a, a, a text out of the Bible and says, the Bible says thus and such, you all know enough now to know whether or not there's something wrong with that. And I asked him a question, so what, what do you do then? And the whole group, they all said various versions, like, well, you have to read several chap or paragraphs before and after to get it, and then you have to remember who wrote it. That's, a group of homeless people know that. Do you know that? You need to have enough facility with the Word of God to know a fake when it comes your way. So Paul says, or actually it's Luke is writing this, Luke is writing that these people in Berea were of a more noble character, not because they were just buying everything Paul said. They were listening to him. They were giving him the opportunity to say what he had to say. But at the same time, they're double-checking him to make sure he's on the right path. And that's where we're all supposed to be. And we need to talk to people with some authority, but the authority from God. Christ-rejecting, hate-filled people are still all over the world today. I don't know if that's a surprise to you, but it shouldn't be. But thank God there are lots of good, godly people in the world. Never think that Christianity is, is about to die out. Christianity is doing just fine worldwide. Christianity is growing by leaps and bounds, and honestly, in, in countries where they are most oppressed. Christianity overall is doing fine. We listen to the news, Western culture and all that, and we hear about all the churches that are closing on an ongoing basis, and how attendance has declined, Da, 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 da. Well, in, I'm sad to say in Western culture that's true. And I personally believe that the reason that's so is in Western culture, typically in Western culture, we have so much, it's easy for us to convince ourselves that we don't need anything else. You go to a country where they don't have anything, and the Word of God is like fresh water. I've been to Africa, I've been to Russia, I've been to India, I've been to all of these places, and, and i got to tell you, I've seen some of the most vibrant, spiritual, godly people in those places than sometimes I see in America. We need to be about the business of preaching the gospel no matter what. 
and to be tough enough to pursue the work. Um, also, thank God that there are fair-minded, peaceful people in the world today who have not yet trusted in the Lord. There are people out there like these Bereans, and I like what the scripture says about it. They were more fair-minded. They were of more noble character. They searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. Many people today are like the Bereans. They're hungry for God. Hungry for his word. Hungry for the truth and ready to do the right thing. Now God will lead us to people like that that are fair-minded like the Bereans. And, and the caring Christians of Thessalonica are, are an example that even in bad environments there can be good people. Another great thing is that God's church helps us search the scriptures. That's crucial because nothing can help us more than searching the scriptures. When I first became a Christian, it was interesting because one of my mentors would always expound this concept that the answer to every single one of your problems is in the Bible. And as a new Christian, I said, oh, that's great. Let me, let me find out how am I going to handle this. Uh, uh, I'm underwater on my mortgage and I'm struggling. So I, I don't find the answer in here. So I, I had to understand that that problem is not something that God particularly cares about. So there isn't going to be a page where your, your monetary problems, here's the answer to those things. The answer to life, more importantly, the answer to eternal life is in this book. But you gotta look at it. You have to understand it. You have to have a broad understanding of scripture. You do not have to be a theologian. You do not have to memorize vast blocks of scripture. By the way, if your brain works that way and you can memorize scripture, I highly recommend it. It doesn't work for me. I, I know what I know, but, but, but if you can memorize, memorization is good, but here's what you need to know. You need to know what the Bible teaches. Well, yeah, that's obvious. It may not be obvious. You need to know what the Bible teaches, not what the particular verse in a particular book. It says that it's thus and such. Because then someone will come along and they'll take that verse and they'll say, okay, that verse means this. You've got to be smart enough to know, I'm not really sure, but that doesn't jive with what Scripture teaches. You have to find what Scripture teaches, not what it says in a certain passage. There are, I have many, many friends who are uh, Mormons. I was involved with the Boy Scouts for forever. And uh, at that time... Uh, a third of the Boy Scouts were Mormons, so I have lots of Mormon friends. Um, and the Mormons have a, a theology of, of baptism for the dead. And they ground that in the Bible. Not in their books, that's a whole other discussion, but they ground it in the Bible. So my question was, well, where does it say that in the Bible? Well, Paul's writing to the Corinthian church, and he's being sarcastic and he's kind of making fun of them for something that they're doing and it's kind of a cast off comment he says so if you don't believe in the resurrection why are you baptizing for the dead and he goes on that's the only place in 66 books of the bible that baptizing for the dead is ever mentioned and paul is actually kind of making fun of them but my Mormon friends have built an entire theology around that you can't really do that so yes, that line is in the Bible, but the Bible doesn't teach that. That's why getting into the scriptures and examining the text and understanding it more fully is, is what we as Christians need to do. And if it doesn't jive with the text, then we have to say, well, you know, I'm not really gonna follow it. In God's word, we have a, a treasure greater than mountains of gold, but most people aren't searching. Years ago, uh, George Barna, he's a Christian survey guy. Does, he surveys everything in Christianity. But George Barna reported that born-again American adults spend seven times more hours a week watching television than they spend in Bible study, worship, and prayer combined. When we search the scriptures, we find nourishment for our souls and light for our lives. Light that we desperately need to live in this dark world. When we search the scriptures, we will find light. We will find life. 
And best of all, we will find Jesus. That's the greatest thing about God's church. This is the place you come to encounter Jesus Christ and to get to know him and his words and to help you model your life after him. The church is not the objective. Let me, let me say it again and let me explain that. The church is not the objective. The objective is not to come to church on Sunday. You come to church to achieve the objective, which is to go out in the world better prepared and better armed and better motivated to be more like Jesus. This is the jiffy move of your soul. You need to come in here, reinforce your faith, reinforce your connection to other Christian brothers and sisters, and be replenished and revitalized and, and encouraged to then go out the door and hit the bricks and spread the word of Jesus Christ. That's what the church is. That's why we want the church to grow. Not because it's better to have a room full of people. That would be lovely. I'd love to see all these in Petersville. That would be fantastic. Good deal. I'd rather have half these pews filled that everybody, when they're done, they go out and they do Christian ministry in the world. Because that's what we're supposed to be doing. Church is here to help you do that. Or at least encourage you to do that. And another thing, God's church is destined to win the greatest war. I always tell people, you know what? I read the back of the book, we win. And we need to conduct ourselves accordingly. By the grace of God and the cross of Christ, Christians are destined to win the war of all wars. That is the war against evil, the war against Satan, and the war against death. We are destined to win the spiritual world for the whole world. It is because our commander is our Lord, Savior, Jesus Christ. Look at our the last couple of verses here. Uh, many of them, therefore, believe. Some people actually paid attention. Not, with not a few Greek women of high standing as well as men. But when the Jews from Thessalonica, remember the ones that ran them out of town? When the Jews from Thessalonica <laughs> learned that the word of God was being proclaimed by Paul down in Berea, they came there too, agitating and stirring up the crowds. When the brothers immediately, then the, the brothers immediately sent Paul off on his way to the sea, but Silas and Timothy remained there. Remember, Silas and Timothy are, are acolytes; they are uh, disciples of Paul, and he's training them up. When we get to, uh, if, when you read First uh, and Second Timothy, you'll see that all of these things with Timothy are designed to get him prepared to be and do what Paul did. So they, they get out of town, but he leaves behind uh, Silas and Timothy. Those who co conducted Paul brought him as far as Athens, and after receiving command from Silas and Timothy to come to him as soon as possible, they departed. The enemy's weapons, the enemy's weapons are fear, lies, intimidation, and violence. Our weapons are the word of God, prayer, and wisdom from God. The enemy's allies are fallen angels and Christ-rejecting people. Our allies are godly people like Silas and Timothy and all the folks in Berea. And our allies are the angels in heaven. But our greatest ally is the God of the whole universe. One of my mentors, whenever he would get wound up, he, he didn't just call him God. He would call him the master and commander of the universe. If that doesn't give you context, I don't know what will. But our greatest ally is God. We are in a war, but we cannot lose. As Jesus said in Matthew 16, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. In church, we may be in a war, but we are in a war we are destined to win. As Paul says later in the book of Romans, who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised. Who is at the right hand of God. Who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for you, your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. And finally, no, 
In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. That's what you take away from all of this. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for loving us enough to stand by us no matter what, to strengthen us, to guide us, to give us wisdom. Father, I pray that uh, all those who hear the word of God will take you up on that and uh, seek your wisdom in your word and be prepared to go out into the world and be what you would have us be. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, the, there's a saying that uh, we are all children of God. Well, that's not true. The children of God are those who accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. But I tell you the truth. Every single human being walking the earth right now has the opportunity. Because there's room at the cross for everybody. In fact, we have a song to that effect. Please stand. <laughs> together, which is also very biblical, especially if you're a Baptist. So uh, we ask a blessing upon the food and the hands that have prepared it. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and lift up his countenance upon you. And in this day, give you courage and wisdom and peace. And all God's people said, Amen. Go in peace.